the thoughts and opinions expressed by the speaker are the speaker's own thoughts and opinions. They are not legal advice and they do not represent the thoughts and opinions of Bryant IP Law LLC. You're listening to the Access Success Podcast, produced by Access U, a division of Access Advertising and Public Relations. Hey, let's do something big. I'm your host, Rachel Schneider. Welcome to the Access Success Podcast, where we highlight important topics focused on education in every form it takes. Today, as you can tell by the episode title, we are talking about trademarks. A brand is what the public uses to identify a company, but the trademark protects specific aspects of that brand. It's where marketing meets the law. And to better explain the process to us, we're welcoming Tara Branskin Holmes to the studio. Tara focuses her practice on representing large and mid size companies and well-funded startups in a broad range of trademark, copyright, and licensing. She has more than 20 years of experience handling matters involving trademark and copyright prosecution, licensing, and corporate agreements for a large cross-section of products and technologies, intellectual property to trademark and domain name disputes, intellectual property-related employment issues, aspects of acquisitions and mergers. She also has been recognized repeatedly for her work as an attorney, including as the Virginia super lawyer, top 50 women Virginia super lawyers, a Virginia legal elite in intellectual property, and by the best lawyers in America since 2009. Tara, thank you again for joining us. Well, you're very welcome. Let me start off by asking how you first decided to specialize in trademark law. That seems very specific. It, it is specific, and I can't say it was a direct... <laughs> It wasn't a, a, a direct line to it. Um, so I'm British and I actually qualified as a solicitor in Britain. And then I went to college here and I, I married someone here. So I found myself in Roanoke, Virginia. And I just happened to end up working at a firm that strangely ended up having a giant uh, windshield shade case. And it involved patents, trademarks, copyright, about everything. And while I chose not to become a litigator and to be a transactional attorney and to prosecute trademarks rather than litigate them, I was hooked. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And it was an area of law that resonated with me in a way that maybe some others didn't. And what are some common disputes that you see nowadays in your work? Like give people a better, um, better idea of what exactly, you know, trademark law looks like. Okay, um, so I'm not a litigator, so I don't have great gory stories to learn from. <laughs> My job is to try to prevent disputes. Um, and so I can describe some of the disputes and problems I encounter to maybe help your listeners avoid them. Yeah. So there are two aspects. There is just applying to register your trademark, and then there's using your trademark. If you apply to register your trademark with the US Patent and Trademark Office, they may object to your application. That is a little different from somebody else, like a trademark owner, objecting to your use of a mark. So on the Patent and Trademark Office side, but then also with third parties, the things I see that start to create problems uh, is if, if your mark gets too close to somebody else's so that there would be confusion in the marketplace. And what does that mean? It, it means that if I am calling up for a service, I'm reaching into the refrigerator for a good, my hand wavers, I call the wrong number, I'm muddled up as to who it is, I am um, getting those services and goods from, that's confusion. If you select a mark, that is too close to somebody else's, the Patent and Trademark Office may not let you register the mark. And then if a third party becomes aware of your efforts, you may receive a cease and desist letter. So my advice is on the front end, do your due diligence, try to select a mark that is original, try to select a mark that isn't too close to somebody else's. The other thing um, I come across and it's not really a dispute, so this is on the Patent and Trademark Office side, is people select really weak marks. Mm. And, and, and what does that mean? It means that your mark is supposed to be a source identifier. So you say your brand and something leaps into my mind about what that brand represents. So I'm gonna come up with some easy ones. 
Dove, Bounty, McDonald's, Exxon, Apple. Immediately in your mind, something you know, came to mind. Mm -hmm. And that is what a trademark is. It's that mental leap. So if you just give me very descriptive words, it is great, particularly if you're a small business, because it immediately tells your consumer what that business is about. You know, it would be very hard for most of us to come up with a weird name like Exxon and use it for our goods and services. It takes a lot of marketing, advertising to create that brand recognition. But in terms of applications to the Patent and Trademark Office, you will likely get rejected or you will end up going on a lesser register, which is where descriptive marks go because it's hard for you to say that people are making that mental leap. Now, it's not to say it can't happen. Bank of America, extremely descriptive mark, but goodness, no one would confuse them with any other bank. So it's not to say it can't be done, but it, it's very tricky to start choosing super descriptive marks. So those are kind of two, two of the main things. So I would just say, do your research. That's the main thing you have to, you have to do. Well, in, in the world of higher ed, we recently saw that Ohio State was successfully able to trademark the word the, so they're now the Ohio State University, as they're being referred to now, um, and as a Wolverine. Um, I don't refer to them that way always, but what was your first reaction to hearing that they could trademark such a common word like that? Yeah, it, it's not typical. So my first thing to say to people is do not worry that you will not be able to use the word the. Don't worry that you won't be able to use it for the most part in your trademarks. It is not going to affect most of us. Um, it's an unusual case. Um, what Ohio State did is they applied for the word the alone. And typically in trademark law, a bit like when I described the dove and the bounty, you need that mental leap. Well, the word the does not create a mental leap. It doesn't really function as a trademark. It is not a source identifier. But what, and so the, and the Patent and Trademark Office initially rejected, and they said, this doesn't function as a trademark. It's just the word the. So what Ohio State did is they produced a lot of evidence that in their specific case, the word the is a source identifier. And when you introduced the subject, you said the, pause Ohio State. They have advertised, they have their fans saying it, it appears in literature, on clothing. So they were able to support that in their narrow exception, and only for collegiate clothing, that they have the right to use the word the. But I don't, it, it's, I think it's a very narrow exception. Mm. I don't think in the main, we should be applying for the word the, I think most of us would fail. Yeah. You know, I, I also, um, I'm not super concerned that other colleges can't apply, you know, when the is part of their mark, you know, they'll be able to put that in there. They just may not apply for it on its own, but most colleges aren't using the word the, to the extent, same extent that Ohio State was. So I, I just don't see it will be that much of an issue. And we have to remember with Ohio State, I think they're most worried about people doing counterfeit goods. Mm -hmm. So I am not sure how much they will care. Maybe they will, I shouldn't speak for them, but beyond their narrow use of the goods, because the key to looking at trademark infringement is anyone else confused. Mm. So if I am selling windows, if I am, you know, doing almost anything else and I use the word the, there's no, there's no confusion. Even for a lot of clothing, it's not actually going to cause that much of a problem. But I don't think I want to have it emblazoned, you know, on the front of my sweatshirt, a giant the, um, and then be selling my merchandise near Ohio State University. So mm -hmm. I don't know the extent to which they will go after people, but I think you can primarily see it in that collegiate clothing field and where they're really being harmed. And just a, an interesting tidbit on this one, talking about doing your research, they actually were nearly stopped by a uh, a prior application. So Mark Jacobs had applied for the word the ahead of them. Mm. And trademarks is all about who filed first. Mm. 
So if someone is ahead of you in line, even if they weren't using before you, they will be cited against you. And so he was actually cited against them. He was a blocking application to them. Um, and they actually came to terms in the end. And I'm sure it's partly because their bargaining power was on, on both sides was pretty strong. And so they came to an arrangement where Mark Jacobs has the word the for like fashion and Ohio State has it for collegiate wear. Um, and I just think this is an interesting example of on some occasions, you can get parties together where there is a dispute and they're all stopping each other getting to their goal mm -hmm. and come to an agreement where everyone agrees to stay out of each other's lane. Because the key is to avoid confusion. You know, marks can coexist as long as consumers aren't confused. I hope yeah. It is. And it, it brings to mind, too, in other types of industries, like I don't know if you're familiar with the country band Lady Antebellum, they recently changed their name to Lady A. And then there was a dispute with another singer who had been going by the name Lady A for quite some time. And if I remember correctly, there was some type of lawsuit that she filed against the country group because she was like, hey, wait, this is already my name um but she obviously wasn't as well known so yeah it's i mean i i do wonder how that all gets worked out because when you have you know a, a person in your same industry who is more well known than you but you were going by that first right i can see how that gets tricky prior rights always trump so if you're using the mark first if you can prove it's a mark, there's a lot of things you have to prove to get to that. That's one of the reasons people like to get federal registrations. It's much easier to prove you have a mark because the federal government has said you have a mark. But so you have to prove that you have a mark. You have to prove that it's you know operating as a mark, all of that good stuff. But if you can, if you can do that, if you have prior rights, they trump, but it always comes down to economics, you know, so you can be in the right, but there are many reasons why you might ultimately come to terms with the other side. And going back to OSU or the OSU case, um, uh, officials had said that the change from simply OSU was to, quote, reflect the natural stature of the institution. And university officials wanted the institution to be known as the Ohio State University because they said OSU could also mean Oregon State and Oklahoma State University. So if I'm understanding you correctly, does that mean that Oregon State and Oklahoma State University cannot put the Oklahoma State University on their clothing? That's something that only OSU can do and only I Ohio guess, State can do? I guess it would depend on whether Ohio State tolerates it and whether they ask mm. them to stop. But if they haven't been using the, I'm not sure why they would start. Right. You know, why would you? That is almost like a, a red flag to a bull. I mean, I, you know what I mean? They already go by the name they go by. They might make modifications, but I doubt that they would do it to irritate, uh, you know, a, another college. That's not their goal, you know, is to, I mean, they all went by OSU before. And they coexisted nicely because people generally aren't confusing them. Um, so who's to say, I guess it could be an issue, but I just, I somehow doubt that if they have good counsel, I don't know that they would, they would do that to themselves. And with today's technology, um, where everyone can create media, everybody can share with the world from their phones, they can create graphics, you know, through Instagram, what are some of the challenges right now when it comes to trademark names? I mean, are disputes only coming up when they actually may pose like a threat to confusion with another party in that same industry? Uh, not necessarily. Um, I would say one of the challenge, well, one of the good things out of the new media, so for a federal registration, you have to show that your mark is used in this thing called federal commerce, which typically means over state lines. And that used to be much harder if you just had a bricks and mortar store in a, one town or in, you know, or some in a state. Whereas now you plop it on the internet, you have got federal commerce. So it's much easier to have a mark. It also means you're, it's much easier to be damaged by somebody else somewhere else. Um, and I think one of the problems we're all encountering is, of course, it's harder to come up with something original. Mm 
it is harder, it, it's much easier, sorry, to bump up against somebody else with a similar mark where you're either unaware of them, but perhaps because of the, you know, through a simple search, you should be aware of them. Um, you really don't perceive there really being any, you know, likely overlap between your businesses, but because you share the internet space, you share, you know, very similar domain names, there starts to be more friction. Now, arguably the same rules apply. If there isn't confusion, you should be able to operate together, you know, but it just depends how close those things get to be. Um, you know, things are a lot closer these days than they used to be. So for, I mean, you can use, uh, Apple as a good example, you know, Apple Music, Apple Computers. Sure. And, uh, be able, you know, we're in very separate lanes. And then you start to see those lanes merge. Um, and also it's in the eye of the beholder. What one person might see as not really creating confusion doesn't mean that somebody who feels impacted by it doesn't. And so it doesn't stop them writing to you and asking you to stop. And then that's when you go and see uh you know an attorney and they advise you how strong your case is but you know if for example i'm a restaurant and i'm just advertising my business in my state and i'm not doing anything beyond that it's just an advertisement it would be hard for somebody in you know the other side of the country who is doing the same thing to create confusion but once you're selling goods you're offering services and the closer those things come together in similarity, that's when you're going to start seeing problems. You know, when the consumer is placing orders with the other company, is calling up, is starting to complain to the other company about your goods and services, that's when you start to see a problem. Mm. Well, I'm curious to hear your take on the Netflix lawsuit that's all over the internet right now, because it uh, had its origins on the internet is where this all started. Fans of the massive hit show Bridgerton are probably aware that there was an unofficial Bridgerton music musical that started gaining popularity on TikTok back in 2020. And the creators, uh, known as Barlow and Bear, released an album all full of songs that they based on the show with no authorization from Netflix. This was just fan created content. That album album actually went on to win a Grammy award and that was all fine. Um, Netflix hadn't said anything, but they recently drew a line in the sand when it came to a live for-profit performance at the Kennedy Center. Um, and the streaming giant is now suing Barlow and Bear, accusing them of blatant infringement of Netflix's intellectual property rights. So who's in the right here? Well, I would say copyright is, this is actually really more of a copyright rather than a trademark case. Mm -hmm. With trademark, if you didn't act promptly, there may be more repercussions. With copyright, not necessarily the case. Um, I think if I am a fan and I want to do a horrible version of a Britney Spears song, for example, <laughs> you know, into, into my camera at home in my bedroom and place it on TikTok. I don't think there's going to be a problem. It's a fair use. It's fan generated content. When I start lifting giant sections of text, songs, music, and I start making a profit and I'm taking profits potentially away from the owner, the creator of that content. And I believe in this case, Netflix says they are or will be putting on concerts of their own. So mm -hmm. if I start, yeah, making a profit on it, it's less and less a fair use. And I think here, particularly Netflix was aggravated because they did offer a licensing deal, which I, I, my understanding is the other side didn't enter into. And the other side has acknowledged that Netflix owns the IP. So I just think they probably went a little too far. Um, you know, you, you see it actually, some businesses, they start up and everyone assumes that everything is free if it's on the internet and they will use photos and suddenly you will receive a cease and desist letter from uh, the business that owns it. Or frequently, it's actually these commercial businesses that have photographs and you have to license them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just, just be aware if you take someone's content and you start to commercialize it and it goes beyond 
you know, Tara standing in my bedroom singing a song, then I might receive that cease and desist letter. But on the whole, I wouldn't worry about, you know, the, the average, you know, the average piece of fan generated content that helps the business. I'm sure that's why Netflix tolerated it for a while. They did a great product. It supported, you know, um, you know, the, the show, it was humorous. Yeah. But parody only gets you so far. And I don't know that this is really parody or commentary, all those things that get you out of it being an infringement here. It, mm -hmm. it, it just mean it may be that they just just went too far. Yeah, I mean, I don't think either of them expected when they posted a, tip, a TikTok just of them playing piano and kind of coming up with these songs that it would go on to win a Grammy. I mean, who would have thought? Um, but we are seeing a lot of people side with Netflix on this one. Um, and others are actually worried about what the future standards will be for fan generated content. Right. right. Um, I would just be careful about the, the amount of you know, mm -hmm. material one lifts if if you're failing to transform it, if you're taking a whole lot of text and you're just adding music that is still derived from the original work. And then if you start to commercialize it, then I, I think you may find yourself running into a problem. Do you think it would be worth it for them to continue and, and go to court over this or do you think they'll settle? Um, I would hope that they would settle because litigation involving IP is extremely expensive. It is extremely time consuming and it takes a toll, an unexpected toll on the people involved. And in this case, it's individuals and it is their art that's being um, you know, put on public display. Netflix, it, it's just a company. They have a, you know, a lot of resources. They are the owner of the IP. Um, and I, I don't think they would be as impacted as the individuals here. And so I would think the in individuals would want to come to terms. And I, I would hope that Netflix would want to support their art. It's, it's great art. They just need to have permission, boundaries, and understanding, um, and, you know, and just, a, just probably a license, which is what most of us have to do when we are using someone else's content. Right, right. I mean, we know it got carried away. Do you think that Netflix should have kind of drawn a line earlier? Or do you think that they took this action when they did at the right time once they started having a for-profit event using the material? Potentially they should have done it earlier, but I don't know that one can fault them for taking a wait and see. Right. You no, know, they didn't come down heavy. They were appreciative, I would guess, mm -hmm. of you know this fan generated content that was of a high caliber. Um, I guess they might say that they had been led to believe that this was all okie dokie, but Netflix had tried to enter into a license with them. It's my understanding. Right. So I, I think they'd made it fairly clear that it was getting to a point where there was an expectation that there would be some contractual boundaries to this use. So I am, you know, maybe in one's mind's eye, one might think that, but I'm not sure that a court is going to say that. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see what all unfolds there. And we are the Access Success Podcast. So I wanted to ask if you would be able to share a success story of yours or, you know, a memory from a, a successful case without delving into too much detail, of course. Well, I'm not a litigator, so I do not have super exciting stories, but I can give some guidance, which I hope yes, is helpful. Yes, please. Yes. So success story, it, it sounds very minor, but is someone comes to me with a mark, we search it, we realize there are problems, we make that mark better. You choose something and people get very wedded to the marks they come up with. But if you can keep an open mind, you often will come up with something stronger, better, something that passes muster, you can get a registration, you're not getting cease and desist letters. It sounds minor, but compared to the alternative, it's terrific. That's what you want to have happen is an application to the Patent and Trademark Office 
that sails through really nicely. Um, on the other side, we will sometimes have people who have applied themselves, which is fine for a trademark, but they didn't do their due diligence. And suddenly they've pulled all of these objections and they feel overwhelmed. I mean, what do, what do I do next? Um, and with those, sometimes we can help, sometimes we can't, and you have to start all over again. And by that time you've lost time and, and to re, you know, rejig your business to a brand new mark is it can be costly. It, it, it defeats the person a bit, you know, but sometimes it has to be done. Um, and also in terms of product, you might have to start pulling product off the shelf. So I don't recommend it. So try to do your homework before selecting a mark. Another kind of success story, it does depend on which side you're on. Um, but with trademarks, the rule is use it or lose it. And so I do recommend if you've applied for a mark, don't get sloppy do use it and use it as you apply for it. If you start changing the look of it, you know, may run into problems. But where this has been helpful for me, but it's more overseas, but it's certainly becoming more the case in the US, is um, marks will sometimes just sit on the register for an age. They're not in use, they're just blocking everybody else. So we will apply for a mark and we get these citations against us. And if they're not in use, we will seek to cancel them. And, you know, hard on the person who has the registration, but it's great for our clients that they don't, you know, this debris just sits there stopping free use of available marks. And so sometimes we can navigate our way through and um, cancel marks that are stopping our clients use stop. And if you think about it, that also means that they're not infringing. They don't have to make changes. It's just uh, something that's sitting out there blocking, but it's really, it's really not in use. Well, I think those are great points. And it's also just good general knowledge to get out there that if people are trying to apply for a mark and they notice that, oh, it's just sitting there, nobody else is using it, what can we do? That they can contact an attorney like you and see what their options are. And maybe also going into meetings with you guys, keep an open mind, but also, you know, still a passion for their business um, to see and watch it grow. It might have to go through some changes, but it's good to know that there are, are people like you guys out there that can help them along the process. Well, they're very welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Well, Tara, thank you so much for joining us. For anybody listening, you can find more information on our blog at accessu.com. So like and subscribe if you enjoyed listening and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Access Success Podcast produced by Access U, a division of Access Advertising and Public Relations. Find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram to keep up with what the world of education needs to hear at Access U Agency and connect with us at accessu.com. Let's do something big.